not preaching from it. I just can't see our thing that we're using tonight. <laughs> and I can, I can expand these things. And so did anybody not get one of these tonight? The ushers have. Anybody need some? Could you guys walk around? Uh, we handed this out last Wednesday. Same thing we handed out last week. One side is from the time of Christ to about 1600. The other side is from 1600 to 2000. Uh, those are the years if you didn't get one. But uh, some of our guys are walking around and uh, getting these things out. Maybe somebody else help out back there. Um, the ushers are busy with the offering. Can you see if there's any of those back there, Brother Williams? And um, they, might, they might have already grabbed them all. But I'd like you to have one of these. And you're not going to memorize it. I mean, I doubt you're going to memorize it. But um, this is just, just to get a picture in your mind of uh, where we are. So you guys... Um, there's two, okay, so that's last week's. Do you have two from last week, Johnny? That's the, well, there's the second half of the first one. There you go, good. So that's, that's first and second. Then do you have the back side of the paper? Maybe, I hope. There you go. So that's probably in two parts also. Well, I can read some of that. Look at there. All right, so let's go to the first one of the first one. And we're in the book of Galatians, all right? So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 1 in a minute. We're going to review just a little bit from last week. So if you have one of these in front of you, what you're looking at is um, the, the, the colors are awkward. Maybe flip the front couple of lights. Yeah, thank you, Don. Uh, if you leave these on me, that'll help. I can see a little bit. But um, the one that's red on the top and yellow on the bottom, that's what's up there now. The left-hand side of it, there's no way to... I'm not smart enough to know how to do this any other way than just stretch the thing out a mile. <clears throat> but um, let's just take a minute and review last week. Then we'll, be, then we'll look at Galatians. And so what we're looking at in, um, um, all right, we're up there. Let's see if I can make this thing work. So um, I need, how about this cordless? Is that working? We get all of our technical stuff going here. Oh, look at there. So up here is the time of Christ. And we talked about this last week. There's the centuries, 100, 200, 300 A.D., all the way up to 13 here. So basically down in this group here is, it started out right away. You'll see in the book of Galatians in a minute, before a hundred years pass from the time of Christ, there is all kinds of heresy. Um, people wonder how could churches get off and know oh, this church was a good church and now it's not. We've been here 40 years, you know how much all the people that have attended our church in 40 years, you know how many differences there are? And there's some who don't even like us, which is really hard to even imagine. But I like us, enough for everybody. But so we're talking about people who are very, very strong in their religious, their religious, religious ideas. Um, we did the kind of a survey this afternoon. Um, in my home growing up on the table, there would be two things when a meal was served salt and pepper that's all there was no a1 sauce there was no salsa there was no picanta this and no chopped up burn your tongue off that uh, there was no vinegar i don't know whatever weird things you put on your food salt and pepper and our normal meals dinner time would be meat and potatoes and a vegetable Breakfast would be eggs and meat and potatoes because we are Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska farm people. I don't know how many years old I was before I ever tasted rice. It just was very un-Asian of us. <laughs> Where I'm sure, all right, take the survey. How many of you, you had rice at least two times today? All right, several hands go up. Sure, I mean, it's not wrong. It's just your culture. Um, you know, some of you don't even don't know what a hush puppy is, you know, or black-eyed peas. What, oh, Mrs. Williams mentioned red beans. Brother Williams, you know what red beans are? I have no idea what a red bean is. I guess it's a bean that's red. I, but since I've gotten my Latin influence, I do know what refried beans are. But they're kind of, a, I don't know what color they are, taupe. But <laughs> anyway, so... Each of us from our background brings with us what we are. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just who we are. It's, 
And, and in some cases, you know, it's beer drinking and NASCAR. All right, get rid of the beer drinking, keep the NASCAR. But, but we're not talking about right and wrong things. We're just talking about cultures and, and habits, you know, marrying your cousins, things like that. Those are just, <laughs> those are, <laughs> depends on what part of the country you're from. You, you bring it with you. Well, now, we've got people who, they were called Judaizers, and they felt like the Jewish law was it. And, um, and in the book of Acts, and you see a group of people coming over from Jerusalem to Antioch telling them, if you don't keep the law, you're not really saved. That's what Jesus saved us from. But and I'm not picking on I'm just telling you, we all have a background. And what we need to do, so important, we submit our background to the word of God. Now, I don't care if you're Swahili or if you're an Eskimo, or if you're from Kansas or Southern California, this should be the thing we all submit ourselves to. And, uh, I, and it doesn't matter what you identify as. This is truth. Everything else is a lie or sub should be subjected to that. Uh, in, in my world, I don't even need salt and pepper and ketchup. I just need salt and ketchup. But so if you picture this, um, this era, this first century, if you look at the dates, 100 and 200, and this is in your in front of you, but I don't know if you can see this, so I want you to have it. Right here, we already have baptismal regeneration being taught, that you get saved by being baptized. Before the, second, before the third century, there's already in here the doctor, the Nicolaitans, I didn't spend any time on that, but this down here is a group of people, basically their instruction came out of, uh, of uh, Alexandria, Egypt, and they were already rewriting the Bible. They were already pulled out the virgin birth. They already pulled out a whole lot of other things, uh, a literal hell. If you go to the 300s, 3, 311, 3 to 350, this era, um, you've got um, baptismal regenerate, infant baptism, 416. Purgatory is invented in about 450 in that area. Um, each, each century had a new group of heresy that came along. In this era, era, there's a guy named Augustine right over there. Augustine was the Bishop of Hippo, and that's in Northeast Africa, um, would be Egypt Egypt now. And he's the one, see this word up here, the Donatists? He, he just declared the Donatists is from hell, and you need to kill all the Donatists. Thousands of them were murdered. And Augustine is the one that many, many people today, um, they just think he's awesome. And... Um, um, uh, I'm getting, I should have had notes here. Um, Augustine was the one that many of the reformers quoted. They thought he was the greatest thing. He was a, he was a horrible man. He was a, I'm not even sure if he believed the gospel. Um, so Augustine here, and, and this is 350 to 400, this era here. Now, this group up here, you see a lot of different countries, cities, and names. Donatists, Monatists, um, the Paterni, Paterians. All these Arnoldists, they followed a guy named Arnold. That's easy. Uh, the Lombards, they followed a guy whose last name was Lombard. Lombardi, he coached some football. Um, these, there were names. But this group of people, we have got quotes that I gave earlier all the way back to the, before the, the year 200, they were already talking about Baptists being condemned. And so the name, the actual name Baptist was present already back here, but they did have other names. These were people that agreed with the things we would call Baptist distinctives. And if you don't have those, they're on a sheet in the back table, you can pick it up, but very simple things. Now, over here, just a quick review. Over here, 787, the worship of saints and images is invented. Uh, Mariolatry, the worship of Mary, back here in 450. Just crazy things. Who would, those are not Bible things. Now. This is basically the church. People differ when they say the Catholic Church started, but this is what became the Catholic Church. Now, right here, um, in the late 1800 years, the late the ninth century, there was a, a split between the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. The, the Greek Orthodox Church, they wanted the capital of the main world religion to be in Constantinople. The Romans wanted it in Rome, in uh, Rome Italy. And so they just split, the church split over it. So you've got Greek, or Greek Orthodox, Roman Catholic. If you've been around Catholicism, the, Roman, the Greek Orthodox Church is way more fancy. 
It's just Catholicism with a lot more fancy stuff and pointier hats and more incense. All right? So go to the, the other side of this paper there, Johnny. Thank you. So here's the Greek Orthodox Church, and here's the Roman Catholic Church. Now, again, we, we, you can follow this group of people. Um, this group of people followed right along. Up here, Walter Lollard, they were Dutch, and they were Baptist as they can be. They were called Lollards like you might be said, oh, you go to Goddard's church. Um, that's just, that's how these names came up. Some of them were hidden in the mountains of France, and some of them were hidden, most of them were hidden somewhere. Now, um, there's a guy named Zwingli, and uh, around the year 1500, and Zwingli was a foul, murderous man. Um, murdered Christians by the thousands. Um, also John Calvin in the same era. Martin Luther, the same era. These guys, they were out to get anybody who would keep their stand on the word of God. Now, here's the problem. You have a, a Catholic church, a Greek Orthodox church, and then later, the, the, and we're going to get to our Bible, hang in there, um, right here, about uh, um, just a little, the early, 1500, early 1500s, John, uh, Martin Luther broke off from the Catholic Church. He got saved, it seems, and um, started the Lutheran Church, and then the Presbyterian Church broke off, the Church of England, this one I mentioned last week broke off because the Pope wouldn't grant a divorce to the King of England, and so the King said, then we're not Catholics anymore, we're, I'll be in charge and that way I can get a divorce. And um, that's where the Church of England or the Anglicans came from. The Methodists came out of the, out of the Church of England and the Anglican. The Holiness Church and Pentecostals came out of the Methodist Church. So let's go back right here. You don't have to move anything, Johnny, but right back there. They all came out of the same roots. Down here in the very bottom where it's green, I think, the Methodists to the Holiness and the Pentecostals, they don't know they're saved. If you, and, and by the way, our, uh, many of our mega churches are rooted in the Calvary Chapel movement and the, the Calvary Chapel and, and the main founders, they had Pentecostal roots. And that's why today we knock on their doors. If you die today, do you know for sure you go to heaven? Well, I'm not really sure. Where have you been going to church? I've been going to the vineyard, the vine, the twig, the branch, the, the bottle, the, the winery. Now, you know why they don't know for sure they're saved? It's because their roots are here in the Holiness and Methodist and Church of England and the Catholic Church, and those churches don't have assurance of salvation. The assurance of salvation is not a Catholic doctrine. No true Catholic has a clue about whether they're going to heaven or not. It's all maybe. And so, but as time passes, they get more influence from other groups and so that's why you're knocking on doors of somebody and uh, you begin showing the scripture and they'll take the scripture and they'll trust Christ and, and, and get saved, wonderfully saved. And praise the Lord for it. But the reason it's not real clear, um, Mrs. Williams brought me something she got from somebody she'd met at work or wherever um, many years ago as a cassette tape, shows how many years ago it was. She said, what do you think of this? It was a kid's story. And the summary, I asked her today to be sure I was remembering right, the summary was, this kid had gone to Sunday school or camp or whatever and had put their faith in Christ, trusted Christ to be saved. But later in life, they, it, it shows them going through life and, you know, they sinned like we all do. And then down the end, they died and they're at the judgment seat. And they're being asked why they should be in heaven knowing they were a sinner. And basically, the kid got thrown in hell. And that was a whole, well, how, why do you give that to kids? How can a kid possibly get saved? How can you get saved? And we'll see in the, in the book of Galatians in a few minutes how common that, that evil doctrine is. So the reason why a lot of the, the megachurch movement in America, it is more feeling-based, it's more emotionally-based. Why? Because it came out of the holiness and the Pentecostal movement. The Methodists were the most wild, let's say, of the Protestant churches. The Congregationalists, the Presbyterian, Lutherans, they were much more stoic. But the Methodists, that's where Peter Cartwright, great preacher, Peter Cartwright, circuit rider, had a huge circuit all the way to Kentucky, all the way west of Kentucky. And uh, he preached all over, preached the gospel as good as you and I would. In fact, he would make fun of the Baptists because you can't get it, you couldn't, he said, you Baptists, you can't be a member of a Baptist church without being baptized. 
you can get to heaven without being baptized. How come it's harder to be a Baptist than it is to get to heaven? And he would harass him like that. And he preached the gospel. A lot of these, a lot of these were great preachers of the gospel. We'll see that in a minute. But you've got the disciples of Christ out of the Presbyterian Church. So, but here's the point. All of these groups of people all came out of there. Consequently, they all just like my kitchen table has salt and pepper on it. We have advanced to mild salsa. But you know what? We're our background. That's where we're from. And um, we we bring with us who we are. Well, these people here, the Lutherans, these are called Protestant because they were here and they protested. They realize the Catholic Church ain't right. The Pope's not sinless. He can't forgive sin. Only Jesus forgives sin. And so they began breaking off. Uh, John Knox was one of the most powerful preachers. Uh, Bloody Mary said she feared the prayers of John Knox more than the armies of any foreign nation. These are these are some great people. So we're not saying these are bad people. Still great people. Um, George Whitfield, probably the greatest evangelist in the time of Christianity, since the time of Christ. He's, a, he's a, a, an Anglican from the Church of England. Um, Billy, Billy Sunday, um, Dwight Moody. Uh, Dwight Moody, the Congregationalist. I forget what Billy Sunday was. Great preachers. So, but not, but you'll see in a minute where it comes from. So these but they all brought baggage with them. One, of the, one piece of baggage was baby baptism. Uh, the church many years ago, um, Rancho Community Church, I don't know who's in charge there now, but one of our men um, just decided to ask, said, why do you baptize babies? He said, yes. He said, do you believe baptizing that baby gets their sins forgiven? He said, no. He said, then why do you baptize babies? He said, because the people like it. So baby baptism, and they're back, by the way, Rancho Community Church and, and um, Canyon Lake Community Church both have roots in Dutch Reformed. And the Dutch Reformed Church came out of this same, this same group of Protestants. They protested and came out and started their own church, but they brought with them the salt and pepper. You that came from Latin countries, you have food that burns my mouth off. You know, I go to Spanish church, and, and they're wanting to feed me, and I say, now, is this gringo? Is this mild? Oh, yeah, not hot, not hot, pastor. It's good, pastor. Yeah. <sighs> liar. How do you say liar in Mexican? But uh, <laughs> liar -o. deceivo. But anyway, um, so the baggage these people brought out, number one, they brought out baby baptism. Another, number two, they brought out they brought out the idea of the state and the church being merged. You know, the Catholic Church is so tied with the government, especially throughout the, the Dark Ages and the Reformation. In Latin America, it still is. And, and every country is developed in different ways. But the Protestant idea is we are over the people. And the church and the state, uh, the, the president, the police, the governors, we're together. And we are over the people and we... We make sure that they're under our thumb. So you got baby baptism, the marriage of the church and state, and, and then you take, here's what happens. I come along and I meet Benny and his family and uh, they're faithful Catholics, Presbyterians, Lutherans, whatever, and I get shown in the Bible, he gets reading the Bible, he gets saved, or maybe he was already saved, but he gets reading the Bible, now he's getting baptized. Now here's what happens. When he makes his public profession of faith, and he gets baptized, you know what he's saying? He's saying Lutheran baptism didn't mean a thing. Catholic baptism of babies is irrelevant. Then what he's saying is, I am no longer trusting the Pope, I'm trusting the Savior. Also what he's saying is, my Bible will be my guide, not the church. And what happens, a bunch of religious leaders are saying, I don't have control of the people anymore. Kill him. You ever wonder why the Protestant leaders murdered millions of Bible believers? What were they doing wrong? What was so horrible? I'll tell you what was so horrible. They were losing their power. Why were the Pharisees so mad at Jesus? He healed their sick, fed the hungry, and taught the word of God, and never once violated a law. Why were they so angry? 
the one, the one point they made it very clear, if they follow him, we will lose our jobs. And that's literally what they said. We'll lose our position. The Romans will take away our title. And so the murder and the anger and the violence toward Bible-believing people, you know what you get in a Bible-believing church? Liberty. Liberty. You, you don't like it here and you want to go to another church? You're still saved. I don't hold you. Your salvation is not in my hand. Your, your salvation is in the hand that's got nail prints in it. And, um, we, and we, you know what? We can still like you. Not very much, but <laughs> you can move across the country and you're not tied to a denomination. There's nobody that has control over you. There's nobody telling you what you have to do. And, and that's a threat. People love power. We got that going in Washington, D.C. right now, and I don't care which party it is. They don't want to lose their authority. Now, all that being said, um, so let's, let's go to the next picture, if you would. Um, what we've got right over here is about 1,600. Okay? Here's 1,600. And lest we not get to the Bible, while you have it on that side, look at Galatians 1. And so let's just read a couple of verses here and... Um, Hopefully we can get to both of these in a few minutes. Galatians chapter 1 in your Bibles. And uh, look at verse look at verse 7. I'm going to pull my notes out now. I've been doing this outline. Okay, let's look at verse 6. Galatians 1 verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him. Notice that him. That's Jesus that you are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. So when you pervert the gospel, when you twist the gospel, you are removed from him, Jesus, to another gospel, which is really not another. Verse eight, though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That's a pretty strong statement. That means I want him to go to hell. Verse nine, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you, ye have received, let him be accursed. So now Paul is totally intolerant of anybody who brings, who messes with the gospel. The idea of how you get saved, that you're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. You mess with that. Paul says, I want you to be cursed. So the first thing we're looking at is that this that doctrine is so vitally important. So doctrine matters. Now, go over to chapter 2 and look at verse 11. Now, we're, who has a, a date in Galatians in your Bible? Is that about 70 or 80 A.D.? 50, 5, 8? Okay, so 58 AD. So we're only talking less than 30 years after Calvary. 30 years ago, Jesus was crucified and we're already having damnable doctrines. Doctrines that are going to condemn people to hell. 30 years. That's less time than we've been here. So understand, people get messed up fast and the devil is against the gospel. He's against the gospel preaching church. What you do, many of you, this is the only church you've ever known. Oh, this is the only type of church you've ever known, others of you. And buses and Sunday school and soul winning and giving the gospel and handing out tracts, it's all you know. You don't understand how rare that is. The devil is after that and after that and after that. And he'll throw in heresies and he'll get you your feelings hurt so you quit and go to a church that won't hurt your feelings because they don't do anything. And the devil's not after those kind of churches. All right, so the first thing, doctrine is huge, keeping our doctrine straight. But go over to chapter 2 and verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, now Antioch was on the coast, straight west from Jerusalem, basically northwest a little bit. And when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before certain came from James, James is the pastor in Jerusalem, a Jewish church, Antioch is a Gentile church. 
For before certain came from James, he did, uh, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. So here's what happened. They're having a church potluck in Antioch, Gentiles and some Jews, but basically it's a Gentile city, a Gentile church. Uh, Paul is there. Peter's there. Barnabas is there. So there's some Christian Jews there, and there's a bunch of non-Jews or Gentiles well, over in Jerusalem, they say, hey, go check out that church in Antioch and see how that thing's going. And so uh, James sends some people over. Well, Peter's at the dinner table. He's at the picnic with the fried chicken and the red beans and uh, other things and rice and lumpia and all those things that you find at a good Baptist church picnic. And Peter sees these Jews coming from, from James. He says, oh, no, I'm sitting with a bunch of Gentile dogs. He gets up and leaves the table. Barnabas is sitting there, a piece of fried chicken just getting in his mouth. He says, I better go to it. He leaves. In a minute, he says that Barnabas was carried away with his dissimulation. And Paul is sitting there looking at this saying, what is wrong with you? We're brethren. No, I don't believe in, in Messianic Jews. You're a child of God. We're all Christians. Now, you can still be a Jew, and you can still be a lost person, or you can be a Christian. But the, the, the people who, who have their menorah and their Seder services because they want to be true to their Jewish culture while they're true to Calvary, that's unscriptural. And if they do it, it's, it's, it's kind of like withdrawing from the table. Um, it doesn't fit the Bible. So look at verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 13. And other Jews dissembled separated they dissembled likewise with him insomuch that barnabas also was carried away with the dissimulation but when i saw they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel notice the truth of the gospels were all one doesn't matter where you're from doesn't matter your culture your country your background we're all the we all belong together where there's neither jew nor greek neither bond nor free so Peter, he said, I said to Peter, I'm in the middle of verse 14, I said to Peter before them all, if thou being a Jew livest after the manner of the Gentiles and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as the Jews? On and on. He is publicly in front of the whole picnic potluck scolding Peter. So number one, doctrine matters. Enough to say, I hope you're, I hope you're cursed. Number two, lifestyle matters. But he didn't pronounce any curse on him. He just chewed him out. You know, Wayne Record, stop vaping. You know, he's not cursed. He said, I do it for my arthritis. It's good for me. Mr. Young gave it to me. <laughs> stop it! So there are doctrines that are going to send people to hell. And we better fuss over those things. There are lifestyles that are a reproach. They're, they're not consistent with your lifestyle. And, and our testimony and who we are says better than that. But it's not the same as that, all right? Now go over a few, a few verses. Um, look over to chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? So we've got people cursed in chapter 1 over theology. We've got people rebuked publicly in chapter 2 over their lifestyle, foolish decisions they're making. And then in chapter 3, he says, Who bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you? He says, he's t now he's given the reason. This only would I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, Capital S, Holy Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? So he's saying to these, these, gent, these uh, whatever, Galatian Christians, and Galatia is a, is a multiple, it's a several churches in an area, it would be like Southern California. He said, how did you get saved? You get saved by faith? Yeah, we got saved by faith. Then what are you doing saying that you've got to be good to stay saved? Have you, you are made, you began in the spirit, are you made perfect by the flesh? Do you know the flesh that couldn't save you is the same flesh that can't make you a successful Christian? That's where a lot of Christians fail. Because you get saved by faith and you think you can do it all. No, you can't. You better every day go to God. 
You better every day be in your Bible. You better every day. Sometimes you see some Christian get off in some crazy, stupid, sinful, or whatever kind of a thing. You think, how'd they do it? They're doing it in the flesh. Paul said, the spirit is willing, the, Jesus said, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Paul said, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. So Christians do bad things. Why? Because the, they get saved by faith, but they don't continue by faith. They start relying on their, their character and their integrity. You know what? Your character could go just like that. But for the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit on you. And that's why you don't look down on other Christians. You, you could make the same choice in just a moment. So what we're looking at here, we are looking at, at people. And if we go to the, the first side of your map, that it starts with the reds at the top and the yellowish colors in the bottom, you know how many messed up things you've seen in your life of 30, 40, 50 years? How many messed up things are going to happen in 500 years? Or 2,000 years? So, you know, where did, we, where did we get this mess in our churches? We just came up with it on our own. And the devil gave us ideas, and, and we got bitter, and we didn't like that person getting the attention, and, and we brought our religious paraphernalia with us I just always I just always thought it was neat to have have a statue get rid of your statues the Bible says that that there's a demon behind every one of those statues now you don't have to be nuts so I know one guy he said he went to the town and he, very strong Catholic town in New England wherever it was and so he got about a four-foot statue of Mary and tossed a rope around its neck and tied it to the bumper of his car and he just wherever he drove around town he's dragging Mary now, that's a funny story, but you don't get people saved doing that. You just get them really mad at you. Um, you know, there is, I don't know, everybody's got to figure out what God wants them to do, have a measure of wisdom. But I don't, I, I'm not going that route, okay, just in case it matters. All right, now, let's look at some things here. So, a few weeks ago, we talked about the dissenter's plea. The dissenter's plea. Now, that's over here. And somewhere in there, and I closed my laptop, somewhere right in here, you see there's several different words, and it was letters written from the prison in England to the king saying, we want to write to teach the Bible to our families. These were Baptists and other dissenters. Quakers would fit in there and some others. And they, the people he was writing to, that's down here. That's the Church of England, the Anglican Church, the Congregational Church, Presbyterian Church. That's this, this, though, was to the Anglicans in England. You'll notice somewhere in here, there is the Portsmouth Compact. And so over here, in those early 1600s, there's um, uh, the, the dissenter's plea. The letter came from prison. We don't know who's, who they were. They were writing to the king, multiple people. It got read into to Parliament. Parliament. The writings from Parliament go into the, the public paper. And Roger Williams reads that. And he's an Anglican bishop, an Anglican pastor, and he is shocked and he's moved and he's, and he's en route to America to bring the gospel to the heathen in America. Well, he gets to America, and by the time he's in America, he quits using the baptismal, baptismal fount, which is basically a birdbath. You put the baby there and you sprinkle some water on their head. And he said, no, that's not biblical. The Bible teaches immersion. They said, you're not an Anglican, you're a Baptist. We're sending you back to England to be reprogrammed by the church. And he runs off into the Narragansett Indians he's already been friends with. He goes up to the Rhode Island area. He buys some land to legally own it, which none of the other people wanted to do. You see, Baptists have always believed in freedom. You don't take things from people. He bought it. Along comes a guy named John Clark right here. Uh, 1638, I think it is, whatever that date's there. He and Roger Williams get together, and they, in the next 12 years, they get permission from the king to uh, get the, the, the land of Rhode Island to be the one spot where there's true religious liberty in America. That's Baptist teaching. This is your roots. Now, the, we won't go back to the map, but that back there, way back there in your map, other people have roots too. My roots are not in Rome. And though my family was Lutheran, my roots are not in Luther. 
because when I got saved, I got saved into, by Baptists and Bible believers, right? So we, we, we skip down through here. We, the, in this group, Martyr's Mirror was written 1660 in, in, uh, by some Dutch guys who put together uh, 1,600 years of Baptist suffering. If you look online for Hearts of Flame or, or Martyr's Mirror, you can get the PDF, the whole the book is huge. Um, Brother Esposito gave me a copy of it right after his last time preaching here. But uh, it's a very expensive book, so unless you really want it, don't buy it. But so uh, they come and, and, and they do the ports. Now, the, the Portsmouth, and I'm doing some review here. You high school seniors and juniors probably know this, but the, the Mayflower Compact, you all know that. In the name of God, amen. And that's the beginning of their commitment. And the, the Mayflower Compact basically says we will be loyal to the King of England and to the Church of England. That's the Mayflower Compact. The Portsmouth Compact that was put together by Roger Williams, John Clark, and that group of Baptists. Roger Williams was never fully a Baptist. He kind of got close, and he called himself a seeker. He never got it quite straightened out. He couldn't get rid of the baggage. And uh, he was in America, but he was still eating rice. Uh, <laughs> um, he, he just couldn't let go of some of those Anglican things, but he, so he struggled with his identity. But he was definitely right on freedom and on baptism, those kind of things. And so they wrote the Portsmouth Compact, and it committed loyalty to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, and the Word of God. Not to England, to no church and to no nation, but to the Bible and to the King of Kings. And that document was the one that brought about the Rhode Island Constitution, and then was the springboard to the American Constitution that's all about freedom. What we live in here, Nobody wants to admit it, but America's roots are Baptist, not just Christian, Baptist. It was, it was the other crowd that hated us. Let me just take a quick moment here. So we've got, by the time the book of, look at the book of, of you don't have to turn there, but the book of Corinthians. They had moral problems, they had legal problems. They were suing each other. Paul says, what in the world are you thinking? Going before us, uh, Christians, going before a secular court, what is wrong with you? Um, they were arguing over Bible doctrine. They were arguing over everything imaginable in the book of 1 Corinthians. They were arguing over spiritual gifts. And what are you thinking? You're better because of this, and you're better because you have that gift and this gift. And 1 Corinthians, all the book, chewing everybody out. This is all first century. So, yeah, there's a whole lot. Now, you look up here. We're going to skip up just for the sake of time. The Great Awakening comes in, 1735, 1755. The Great Awakening was a Protestant awakening now protestants are those people who came out of rome you're not protestant can you go back to our picture the first one that had all of them johnny there, uh, next one okay this is protestant when you use the word protestant they all protested from within the roman catholic church they're protestants you were never in the catholic church our our roots some of you might have your roots in catholicism but now you're a baptist our spiritual roots are here so we're not Protestants, all right? Go back up to where we were, Johnny, if you can find that. So here we get the Great Awakening. There was a second uh, Great Awakening, a revival. Uh, the, here's Charles Finney. Charles Finney wasn't a Baptist, great preacher. George Whitfield back in here, unbelievable preacher and thousands of people getting saved. Right in here, these great revivals. Uh, one of Charles, one of George Whitfield's converts was Shubal Stearns right here. He goes down uh, to Sandy Creek, uh, and starts a Sandy Creek Baptist Church in North Carolina. Probably the reason we have a Bible Belt is Shubal Stern, and a, a Baptist, a crazy Baptist. And so, but this era, the Great Awakening, it was these people who were Protestants saying that Bible does say you got to get born again. That Bible does say we got to live holy lives. See, one of the things that I got sidetracked. One of the things that came out with Protestants, they brought from the Catholic Church is your personal holiness didn't matter. As long as you went to confession, as long, you, know, you could go get drunk with the priest. You could gamble. I mean, you that were former Catholics, you know. I lived right almost next door to the Catholic Church. Man, they had their bingo things and selling booze and all kinds of stuff. Personal holiness was not a part of that, the roots in Catholicism. And that's why one of the things about us is we, of the Baptist acrostic, if you don't have it, it's on the table back there. We believe in a separated life, a holy life. It does matter where you go to church. 
It doesn't matter what we believe. Now, we're not better than anybody, but our theological roots are different. So you get up here. Th there was a, a preacher there in the south out of the ministry of, of Shubal Stearns that he, he had a bunch of handful of young men, five or six young men, wanted to be preachers, and so he takes them up to a Harvard, Princeton, Yale, one of those. Those are all Protestant schools. He brought them up there, and they said, we don't want your Baptist trash in our school. It's like a Democrat saying, let's reach across the table and get along. Now, we're gonna, I'm not going to go any further and get you to right here. So you've heard of the Fulton Street prayer meetings, Protestant base, wonderful times, great revivals. Charles Finney, great revivals. And, but what happened right here, if you're looking at your map, um, Baptists, it says tri -lit, tri Triennial Convention. Baptists were scattered. They were very unorganized. That's why we're the way we are. It's historic. It's in our roots. All these independent, remember one of the things about Baptist churches is we all believe in autonomy, individual. So we're not tied together. Well, what happened is a bunch of them said, look, we got to get organized. There's a, there's a group in here. Um, uh, I'm not sure where it is with that. I should have my computer open. There's a group in here that didn't believe in, they are hard shell Baptists somewhere up in here. And they didn't believe in missions. They were Calvinists. And they taught against missions. Well, this tri, uh, uh, Triennial Convention got together, and every three years they'd get together to see how all the churches are doing. They'd preach to one another, and they'd say, let's support this missionary. Let's print some curriculum. Let's organize churches. And they did it every three years. Well, the problem is I come in, and I'm the one who's getting Sunday school material together. Tim and, and Chandra Grissom come along, and they're organizing missions work. Somebody else is organizing local evangelistic meetings. And so they had so much going on, it was very awkward, and they're all working with this same group of churches. And so they, out of necessity, created an organization. And they went right back to where the Protestants were. Somebody up here telling everybody down here what to do. A good thing becomes a bad thing. Lottie, Lottie Moon, maybe the most famous Southern Baptist missionary, and she was so famous for her missions work that, that every Southern Baptist church in America gave monthly to the Lottie Moon Missions Fund. It all went in there. And if, if I was to today go to the Southern Baptist and say, I want to join the Southern Baptist Convention, and if I were looking for support, it would come out of that fund. Um, but it would be the Southern Baptist bigwigs that approve me. See, when a missionary comes here, we support them. And if they get off theologically or whatever, we stop supporting them. We believe in autonomous churches, independent churches. But what happens is, and we've talked, you know, this is weeks past, but Baptists started creating their own hierarchy. It's just natural. And they're not bad people. It just happens. Um, in our years in our church, we've tried so hard to be careful about that. We, churches in this era, churches in this era, they wanted to train their, their preachers. But this group, the, the Protestants, they were educated and they were organized. So they started Princeton and Harvard and Yale and schools like that. And so these Southern Baptist converts were sending their young people to Protestant schools to be trained. And they're coming back Protestants, messing up the Baptist churches. And that's why this group divided from here, and this group, go to, can you go to the next one, Johnny? We'll get the other half. And so you got, you, you've got each group, a different group of Baptists. And it's a, it's a mess. It's a very natural mess. We'll wrap some of this up and go to some other Bible next week. But, but to understand this, there's a reason we're Baptists. We're not any better than anybody. But that we are independent Fundamental means we go back to the fundamental basics of the Baptist beliefs of Bible teaching. Um, you know, and someone says, well, we all go back to the same Bible. Really? Is that why you baptize people? You sprinkle them when they're babies? 
Um, is that why you have a group of people that tell this group of people that tell this group? Of, no, no, there's, let's go back to all of it. That's why we have soul winning. Why do we have soul winning? Because Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So we do that. We don't, he didn't say put a, a website out and put a welcome sign in the building. He said, you go tell those people. He said, go to, go to the poor. He said, go to the highways in the hedges. That's why we're going to be at the park tomorrow night. Not worried. We're not better than anybody else. We're just trying to obey. And there'll be people knocking on doors. Last week, I was with the group. We, we, we're probably knocking on $700,000 doors, right, Brother Steve? I mean, maybe. I mean, those are amazing houses up there. Um, all the world, to every creature. And so we're, we're certainly needy people, but we have wonderful spiritual roots. All right, let's pray. Father, help us. And uh, we'd ask for wisdom that we might cling to the simple truths of your book, that we might love people, that we might know who we are, where we came from. And we do, we do pray for help to keep our doctrine right. There in the book of Galatia, we see people getting off, uh, people getting sidetracked early on. And, and so we pray for help that, that we might preserve the truth of your book. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you. Have a great evening. And if you bring these back, we might talk a little more about them next week or we might be on a totally different subject.